Good morning, and thank you for joining us at short notice. I'm here with Marine Deckers, Chairman of Unilever, and Graham Pitkethley, Chief Financial Officer, who will both take you through this morning's announcement. We expect the presentation to take around 15 minutes, and we'll then leave some time for your questions. First, I draw your attention to the disclaimer relating to forward-looking statements and the purpose of this presentation. And with that, I'll hand over to Marine. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, getting on the call with us. Um, as you know, part of Unilever's long-term success is its ability to adapt to changing conditions. And our challenge is always balancing our scale on the one hand and being agile, agility on the other hand. And the organizational evolution is no exception. Over the last 15 years, Unilever has transformed through several major change programs. Back in 2005, we abandoned the dual executive chairman structure and replaced it with a single non-executive chairman and a single ch ch chief executive officer. We also announced at the time the One Unilever program, which substantially simplified the business and leveraged our local scale more effectively by moving from 160 to 22 operating companies. In 2011, we simplified this further with the move to eight ge ge geography clusters and four global categories. The global categories were established to leverage our scale and our expertise in innovation. They set category strategies and manage the innovation process, while the teams in each of our eight geography clusters deployed the global innovations and focused on top and bottom line delivery. Then in 2014, we further sharpened the category strategies to create unique focus and capabilities according to the different strategic drivers needed in those categories to succeed. And this resulted in a further step up in the competitive performance of Unilever and allowed us to grow ahead of our markets. However, the speed of change is accelerating and requires us to adjust as well. And that is why in 2016, Paul Pullman and his team implemented the Connected for Growth change program. Connected for Growth, as you know, is a holistic change program that covers ways of working, behaviors, and culture. We put in place a leaner, even more consumer-facing organization. And that has enabled us to roll out global innovations faster, be more agile, and effective in responding to local trends. With the Connected for Growth organization, we are being both more global and at the same time more local. And we're starting to see quality and speed of innovation further improve with better tailoring to individual market needs. So then we get to today. Today we are announcing the next steps in the ongoing transformation of Unilever into a simpler, more agile and more competitive business. The changes are the natural next step to our Connected for Growth program, which has been implemented successfully and with speed. And we're announcing two important changes today. First, we are evolving our organization to be based on three more empowered divisions. One is beauty and personal care, two is home care, and three is food and refreshment. And each of these three divisions will be responsible for brand, channel, portfolio, and innovation strategy. And they will also be more empowered to make in-year trade-offs and allocate resources across geographies, driving higher performance through more differentiated and prioritized choices. Now, the headquarters of two divisions, beauty and personal care and home care, will be in London and the headquarters of the food and refreshment division will continue to be in Rotterdam. The divisions will benefit from direct connectivity to key markets through our country category business teams and from slimmed down global support structures. And this includes a smaller corporate center supporting the divisions. 
Then secondly, following a comprehensive board review, we are proposing to simplify our corporate structure from two separate companies and two shareholdings, NV and PLC, into a single holding company with a single class of shares. And this new holding company will be incorporated in the Netherlands. The proposed simplification will provide greater flexibility for strategic portfolio change and further strengthen corporate governance. And Graham and I will take you through the changes in more detail. So each of the three divisions has significant global scale, obviously, and is well placed to compete. You know beauty and personal care led by Ellen Yoop over which is around 21 billion in turnover. Then home care led by Case Kruithoff, 11 billion in turnover. And foods and refreshment led by Nitin Parnpi is 20 billion in turnover after the spreads disposal. So these three divisions will continue to be responsible for strategy and portfolio decisions, for developing global and local innovation, including consumer insights, research, product development, and advertising, and making supply chain investment decisions. From now on, however, the divisions will also have a significantly stronger role in managing financial performance, and they will set growth and profit targets for each geography, and will also now be able to make trade-offs and reallocate resources more dynamically during the year. This will further increase our agility and competitiveness in our markets. And the established direct reporting lines on the C4G from country category business teams will enable these divisions to know where to rapidly deploy resources in response to local needs. Then the second change, the proposed change to our corporate structure. As you know, since its formation in 1930, now 88 years ago, Unilever has been owned through two separately listed companies, a Dutch NV and a UK PLC. And these companies have been governed by detailed agreements to maintain the parity between economic rights of the respective shareholders. The board has concluded that it's in the best interest of Unilever and its shareholders as a whole to simplify the group structure from two separate companies into a single holding company. And this company will be incorporated and tax resident in the Netherlands. The decision to incorporate the legal entity in the Netherlands reflects the fact that the shares in NV account for approximately 55% of the group's combined ordinary share capital and trade with greater liquidity than PLC shares. So as I mentioned earlier, the proposed simplification will provide greater flexibility for strategic portfolio change, including through equity settled acquisitions or demergers. And it will also lead to improved corporate governance as we remove complexity and increase transparency. So let me spend a few moments on corporate governance, which Unilever and its board obviously take very, very seriously. Over the last 15 years, we've taken major steps to be at the forefront of good corporate governance, including most recently the acquisition of the NV preference shares, which had as you know, disproportionate voting rights. Less than 1% of the value of NV, but 20% of the voting rights. And today's announcement will further strengthen Unilever's corporate governance. We will continue to apply both UK and Dutch corporate governance codes. We'll continue to follow UK, Dutch and US listing rules will continue to hold annual elections of all directors, will continue to have a separate chairman and CEO, and will continue to have a strong independent board with diverse experiences. But in addition, following completion of the new corporate structure, we will cancel all preference shares, and we will propose to close the NV Trust Office 
and terminate the related depository receipt structure. Plus, we'll move to a 5 plus 5% 5 non-preemption rights. So these measures will create, for the first time since 1930, a principle of one share, one vote for all shareholders, and we will have greater simplicity upon removal of the detailed equalization agreements between NV and PLC. So, with that, I would like to now um, hand it over to our CFO, Graeme, who will take you through some of the details around the simplification of our corporate structure, Graeme. Thanks, Marijn. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, first of all, how will we uh, achieve the proposed simplification? Well, we intend to introduce a single holding company, that's called here New NV, with one class of shares and a global pool of liquidity. As Marijn said, this company will be incorporated and tax resident in the Netherlands. Unilever will continue to be listed in the UK and in the Netherlands and in the United States. We will seek a premium listing on the London Stock Exchange and listings on the Euronext in Amsterdam and on the New York Stock Exchange. This is different, of course, from index inclusion. It will be for the index providers to decide in which indices new NV should be included. Obviously, for confidentiality reasons, we've not yet been able to engage with index providers, but we'll start to do that in due course. We will continue to report earnings and declare dividends in euros, as has been our practice for many years now. There'll be no change to our policy of seeking to pay an attractive, growing and sustainable dividend. Arrangements will be made to ensure that those UK shareholders who prefer to receive dividends in British pounds can continue to do so, and holders of US listed shares will continue to receive dividends in US dollars. Unilever NV dividends are currently subject to Dutch dividend withholding tax at a rate of 15%. Now, the Dutch government has announced that the Dutch dividend withholding tax will be abolished with effect from the 1st of January 2020. Following simplification of our corporate structure and until the abolition of the Dutch dividend withholding tax, an alternative means of receiving distributions via capital will be available, uh, which is not subject to that dividend withholding tax. As Marijn has already explained, Unilever will remain committed to being at the forefront of good corporate governance and we will continue to apply both the UK and Dutch corporate governance codes. The simplification of PLC and NV under a new single company will be achieved through a combined process that involves for PS, PLC a UK scheme of arrangement and for NV a Dutch statutory merger. One new ordinary share in new NV will be issued for each NV ordinary share and for each PLC ordinary share, thus maintaining the economic interests of any shareholder. In order to facilitate trading of new NV shares on the London Stock Exchange, Unilever proposes the creation of depository interests which can be traded in British pounds. The exchange of shares in NV and PLC for new NV shares is not expected to be a taxable event for shareholders resident in either the Netherlands, the UK or the United States. Finally, I want to be really clear that uh, Unilever's strategy, our 2020 financial goals and the composition of the board of Unilever are all unaffected by these changes. The proposed simplification will be subject to certain conditions, including regulatory filings and the approvals of shareholders in the current NV and PLC. And following today's announcement, we will also commence discussions with the credit rating agencies. We do expect that our strong credit rating will be unaffected by the simplification of our corporate structure. Further information will, of course, be provided in the regulatory filings and in the shareholder communication, which will be circulated in the months leading up to the extraordinary general meetings to be convened to approve the simplification. We expect to spend, uh, send out documents to shareholders in the third quarter of 2018 and hold the EGMs, the extraordinary general meetings, a few weeks later. Implementation is expected to take place at the end of the year. Now, the proposed simplification of our corporate structure is, of course, a very important milestone in our history. 
But what remains critically important for our success is that we combine our scale with agility. Our business is not run day to day by a small corporate center, but by three empowered divisions. And those divisions will leverage Unilever's local go-to-market operations, their local management teams, and our local distribution scale. They will also benefit from Unilever's global scale, including procurement across our value chain, low-cost financing, global business services, and the data and digital capabilities, such as we provide through our U-Studios and People Data Centers. Today's announcements are the logical next steps in the transformation of Unilever. The changes build upon and are enabled by our Connected for Growth program and will further drive long-term shareholder value in a rapidly changing business environment. In summary then, the changes will make our business simpler. They will provide us with increased flexibility and dynamism. They will strengthen our corporate governance and they will finally enable the divisions to better serve their consumers, balancing scale and agility to drive stronger performance across our markets. And with that, let's uh, move on to your questions. All right, thank you, Graham. Uh, as a reminder, if you want to ask a question, please press star one. And if you wish to cancel your question, press star two. If you're listening to the conference call on a speakerphone, please use the handset while asking your question. And finally, please keep your questions to a maximum of two. <coughs> So uh, I see we've got the first question coming in from uh, Warren Ackerman at SockGen. Do you want to go ahead, Warren? Here at SockGen. Um, hi, um, two questions. The first one is slightly technical, but I think an important one on the indices. I'm a bit surprised, Graham, that you didn't engage with the index providers beforehand. I mean, I'm looking at the rules determining nationality and my take would be it seems very difficult for you to stay in the FTSE 100 and the all share. I mean, there is an important liquidity rule which Holland would pass. So it would seem to me that the euro stock's weight would increase. But obviously, that would be quite a big blow for UK investors and especially income investors. I appreciate you're now engaging. But are you preparing for that eventuality? And are you seeking any kind of exemptions? And can you explain in brief how the depository interest certificate would work in the UK? Yeah, more and then secondly, um, could you maybe give some examples of the greater flexibility for strategic portfolio change? You've mentioned acquisitions and demergers, and maybe just some examples to, to flesh out colour for us in terms of how these three divisions would be more dynamic in terms of resource allocation. Thank you. Uh, morning, Warren. Um, so on the, on the question of, of why we uh, haven't consulted with the index providers before now, that's simply on confidentiality. I mean, we obviously have been, uh, you know, it's been a, a very, very comprehensive and detailed review by the board. And with the announcement today, that gives us the opportunity to, uh, to embark on that. Um, you, you, just to make sure that, that, uh, that, that everybody has the, the, the facts today, Currently, only the proportion of Unilever's value that's represented by PLC is included in the UK indices, the FTSE 100, and only that represented by NV is included in the Eurozone index, which is the, the Eurostox. Um, after simplification, of course, any index in which we're represented will reflect the full value of the group. And, uh, you know, with the simplification taking place under NV, um, you know, it would seem clear that, that from a Eurostox perspective, we would move from 55% representation in Eurostox to 100% of the company being there. Um, the rules on, uh, on index uh, inclusion, of course, are very sensitive and, uh, and determined by the index providers. Um, we will engage. Uh, with the index providers, specifically regarding the, the FTSE 100. Um, and, we'll, uh, and we'll see where, where that takes us. It's really, as I said, for the individual users of the indices to ask how those rules might be applied and under which index nationality Unilever might be uh, designated. But at the end of the day, this is about choosing the right group structure for the long term, yeah. rather than basing it on, on individual investment mandates of, of, a, of sure. a subset of shareholders. And for the benefit of all the shareholders, that's the, uh, the strategic moves we've taken. Just to take the uh, roll into your second question around the types of flexibility. Um, Marine, do you want yeah. to pick that up? Yeah. Just, um, you know, the flexibility uh, is really um, that I was referring to, and I think you're referring to, is on the M&A side. Mm. Um, both from an acquisition point of view, when you use shares as a currency, and um, from a uh, 
potential divestiture or, or situation. Um, so um, when you uh, are uh, looking to do a uh, relatively large acquisition for shares in the US, for instance, um, there is a uh, current tax rule that uh, does not clearly permit a tax-free exchange for US shareholders in a target in the case of a dual-headed uh, structure. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, that means that a capital gain situation would kick in for uh, US investors if they would take shares from a dual-headed structure, which is obviously uh, undesirable. So that's mm -hmm. one element of it. And I, I don't want to necessarily go through all the technicalities, but uh, also in the case of a divestiture, or, or a, in, like in the spreads case, uh, we encountered that when, as we were looking at certain options on, on how to uh, separate from spreads, uh, our, our options were limited, more limited as a result of this dual-headed structure. And we can go through some of the details on that with you if you're really interested in that level of detail. But, um, you know, given how the world moves, uh, you know, you don't want those restrictions to be there if you can avoid them. And by the time you really want to do something, obviously it's too late <laughs> to, to mm. make these changes quickly, right? So, and, and I, I, wanna, I wanna emphasize that we don't have you know, any plans or intentions at the moment to do things like that, uh, but uh, we need to make sure that we have the optimum optionality uh, in the company. And that's why the board uh, decided this. Or okay. Do, do All right. Thanks, guys. Just your final point on depository oh. interest. Yeah. The, the, basically, it's to say it's very similar to an American uh, ADR, ADR. Um, okay. and, and we'll create Crest uh, depository interests for old PLC holders as an alternative to holding through Euroclear. So that should enable okay. UK investors to deal in uh, in sterling through LSE. Okay. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Byron. Cheers, thanks. Warren. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Warren. Um, next question is from Eileen Ku at Morgan Stanley. Uh, can you go ahead, Eileen? Morning, gentlemen. Uh, two questions for me. The first one is um, the last time that the board did a corporate governance review that was uh, detailed like this in 2005, the conclusion was that the dual structure would enhance uh, flexibility. So what's changed this time? Is it simply the fact of the, the bid from Kraft Heinz last year? Um, secondly, is the ultimate goal for the food and refreshment business to, to demerge or spin it off? Thanks very much. Okay, I'll, I'll take the, um, the first one because it's very easy for me. I wasn't here in 2005, <laughs> so, so I don't know what they were doing back then, but um, and no, seriously. Um, very, very uh, clear that um, uh, we're all very, very convinced that this is the right way to go, to go to this single structure. And, um, you know, I think having come in two, two years ago, if I may say, that um, in 2005, um, these were really also operationally, not just from a corporate structure point of view, two very, very different companies that had a history to be run by two executive chairmen. And this balance between you know, the, the, the Dutch and the UK part, that if the Dutch got new furniture, the UK needed new furniture right away. I mean, there was, there was a very much, a, there has to be an absolute balance between the two, and that's how the place was run. And then, as I mentioned in 2005, when one Unilever came, um, you know, this was um, uh, operationally addressed, but not from a corporate structure point of view. And, 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 and now that we are operationally really completely one company, you know, it, it may be easier to then also get to the decision of uh, let's not drag that old structure further along because nobody here thinks like that anymore. Um, Eileen, I'll maybe tackle your second question. There's there's no goal to uh, to demerge the the food and refreshment business. It, it really the, the creation of the divisions is is the natural next step in the continued transformation 
into a business that's stronger and more agile and continues to leverage its scale that has that agility that Marine mentioned in the presentation. The divisions will have more levers to deliver their strategic objectives, uh, to support the local CCBTs in the markets, which, which now report directly to them, um, but still very much focused on the front line of our business, where the consumers are and where, where, where all you know, trends arise from. And the divisions will be more deeply involved in in-year performance management and able to manage more dynamically resources and choices across geography during the course of the year. So it's, uh, it, 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 the whole purpose really is to give us a more strong business, a business that performs more effectively and continues to be highly competitive in its markets. Okay, Thank thanks. thanks, Graham. Um, We've got one more question from Pina Ergen at UBS. Go ahead, Pina. Morning, Pina. Hello. Um, I have two questions, please. First, uh, I noticed the addition of beauty to the name of the personal care division. Could you comment on that? Does that give us an indication of where you expect Unilever's portfolio to evolve in the future? And then the second one is a really quick one. Um, today's announcement implies that the trust office will go. Could you establish a new foundation in the future, or would you need shareholder votes to be able to do that? Thank you. Thanks for the questions, Pina. I'll take the first one. Um, yeah, because <laughs> I'm the most beautiful one here. Um, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the addition of beauty onto the name of personal care um, with the um, prestige acquisitions we have made and the way in which that prestige group, uh, which sits as part of personal care, uh, has performed. We're now up to about a, about a half a billion business, um, and we've made uh, you know, substantial uh, uh, build-up of, of you know, very attractive brands and businesses, Dermalogica, Kate Somerville, Murad, Hourglass Cosmetics, etc. Um, you know, we, we, we've, we, the beauty component of our business, and in particular the prestige component of our personal care, uh, uh, business has become ever stronger and, and more you know, strategically focused and that's the simple reason for it that uh, you know we, we're a personal care business yes that's a very broad description but we want to highlight uh, the, the, um, the, the substantial presence we have within, uh, within the beauty space um, through, that, uh, through that prestige business that's the, that's the key reason for that. I'll, I'll try to answer your, uh, your other question, your second question about the trust office. So, um, you know, it's our um, uh, desire and intention to uh, close the, um, the trust office, but the company cannot alone make uh, that decision. The termination of the uh, depository receipt structure in the Netherlands requires a mutual decision by both the trust office and by Unilever and it requires approval by the depository receipt holders. So uh, this is our intention, but, but um, we don't 100% control that decision. And also I would say that, um, um, you know, the, the, I, I don't know if you understand this, but the trust office sort of a, a counterpart repre representing the smaller shareholders vis-a-vis -vis the holders of the preference shares. That's why it was, because we had preference shares, the trust office was created in the first place. And since we are canceling the prefer, pref shares, the need for a trust office, in our opinion, is no longer there. So, so these two are linked. And then we also um, have no um, uh, uh, plans at all to, to create any other structures there, uh, like a stichting or a, a foundation uh, that, um, you know, would, would, would somehow create an alternative for the trust office. We have no intention of doing that. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have uh, a question here from Reg Watson and ING. Uh, go ahead, Reg, with the question. Um, morning, all. Uh, Graham, coming back to the question of the index um, inclusion, I appreciate that it's up to the index providers, um, but what is your preference for the index that you would like to be included in? Which one will you lobby for? Um, Reg, the, the, bo both the FTSE 100 and, and, and Eurostox are, are preeminent indices and very, very 
uh, well supported. So the, the, we think there's there's equivalence there. We we come from a from a you know historical situation where we had two separate companies and therefore we were not uniquely but almost uniquely eligible for inclusion in both indices. And you know from our perspective, it would be absolutely ideal to retain. Uh, representation in both indices but of course appreciate that that's for the index providers and you know there's a fundamental principle of exclusivity around the major indices that will uh, that will be a, be a critical factor as they uh, as they make that consideration um, so you know that that's um, that's sort of where we are I mean, yeah coming back to that point about index integrity and the exclusivity um, you if you were forced to choose which would you go for well, we, we wouldn't be because it's not, it's not our choice. It's the index provider's choice. It's their decision, not, not ours. Okay, so are you, are you not actually lobbying for one or the other then in, uh, in, your, in I, your discussions I, I, with I, the index I, providers? I, You're just going to let them get on with it? Well, I, th I think that's the natural way of it. It's, it's, if anything, it's for investors to lobby if they have a point of view on whether exclusivity of an index is more valuable than, 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 than continuing... The, the status the status quo this for, for, for us for shareholders not for us okay thank you um, Thanks, and second uh, question uh, um, if I recall correctly at the time of the last review um, tax was also a consideration in not um, merging the dual listed structure um, why, why is that not a consideration this time as well um, I, I, I couldn't really speak to the past on, on, on tax as a, as a consideration I don't think from the point of view of the corporation, um, we, we don't think that the simplification into a single holding company is going to have a material impact on where we pay our tax. Where we pay our tax is fundamentally a function of where our operations are, where our brands are, where our customers are, where we have our factories, where we have our employees around the world, and that really isn't changing, so we don't expect there'll be a, any change really in, in the tax landscape. Okay. I, I was led to believe that, that the tax issue is not just simply about the tax domicile, but also the issue of legal change of ownership. So there are a lot of um, uh, Unilever entities that were either wholly owned by the NV or the PLC, and that simplifying the corporate structure would mean a transfer of uh, ownership or control, which would potentially crystallise tax liabilities. No, I, I, I don't think that was a question around, around unification, which is you know, relatively, I don't, don't want to say simple because it's very complicated and there's a lot of legal processes and, and, and shareholder consultation and votes to, be, to, be, to, be, to take place. But um, I think, you know, that, that, that sort of tax friction that you're talking about and those sorts of tax costs um, are actually the very reason why we think simplifying in a single company is important because uh, to, to the point that Marine explained earlier, the, 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 the ability to demerge parts of the business in a, in a much more tax effective way is facilitated by this and therefore we have greater strategic optionality for shareholders in the years and decades ahead in doing that. I should emphasize we don't have any plans for significant acquisitions or demergers, et cetera, but all of that is facilitated by the simplification that we're proposing today. Okay, and, and um, finally, um, aside from tax, are there any other, oh sorry, well, including tax, are there any uh, costs or exceptionals that you'll be booking um, for, for, for this exercise? No, I don't, I don't think there's anything material, uh, you know, one way or the other that, that, that comes around from this. It's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the um, yeah, not, not, not material in the context of, the, of the, the, the fundamental strategy of the company. Okay, thank you. Thanks, okay, Raj. thanks, thanks, Raj. Uh, okay, we have no more questions, so I will hand back to Marine to conclude the call. All right, thank you very much. Um, so again, uh, thank you for joining us at uh, such uh, short note. As, uh, I think the changes that we have announced today will clearly prepare Unilever for some of the decades ahead of us. Unilever will be, we believe, a stronger, simpler organization that balances scale and agility for superior performance. And we want to be sure that all shareholders understand the proposal. So please, please reach out to us over the coming weeks when you have any questions. So with that, the call is closed. And thank you very much again.